So today uh, we re happen to read the topic. I think I would like to title is how to love those you hate. Mm. How to love those you hate. <laughs> you may find a very this topic a very compelling or a very squeezy topic. And we happen to read the portion of Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 48. And it's hardly four or five verses over there, but uh, um, it's very powerful and compelling. And when I say this, how to love those you hate, if I talk to a, a group of Christians, perhaps they may think, no, 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 I don't have anyone to hate. Then I thought, okay, I should say, uh, let me remove the word hate and then say the word, how to love those you don't like. How to love those you don't like. When I ask that question, probably someone will say, Okay, I don't like this person. I don't like that person. Perhaps that person is there in your classroom. I see all of you are students. So you perhaps they are in the classroom or some of you, perhaps you don't like them who is in your family itself or it could be your own sibling or it could be your parents or it could be your uncle and cousins or anybody or it could be. But those you hate is someone is very closer to you. Okay, they are not someone in Africa. Let me understand. Let me put it very clear. You don't hate someone in Africa, but you will hate someone next to you. That's how Jesus is talking about someone who's very closer to you. So in the next few minutes, I want to uh, unpack this particular thing, what Jesus is trying to talk on this word. Uh, chapter five of Matthew, verse 43, okay? You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. Now, this is from Jesus directly, right at starting of the Matthew's gospel, the first book in the Bible. Now, um, I want to keep you in mind, keep in mind who is Jesus talking to, because you need to understand the context. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 verse 1 will tell you Jesus is talking to the crowd. If you can see now when Jesus saw the crowd, he down, he sat down or on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him. So it is like two people, two sec, two segment or two groups are there, which is the crowd as well as the disciples. Now, disciples are people who are like saying, yes, Jesus, we will follow you. In this room as well, so many people are like disciples, right? Hey, I want to follow Jesus. But then there are some people like the crowd who are just getting to know Jesus, who don't know Jesus in a very personal sense. You still do not believe in Jesus. Some of you, maybe, I don't know. But uh, Jesus was talking to these kind of audience, okay? Two, two segments I want to tell you. Now, we have been studying on, on the Sermon on the Mount series for quite a while because we want to get the foundations very clear. If you want to be a Jesus believer or Jesus follower or Jesus disciple, it is it has very robust or strong kingdom principles because it's not like what the world teaches, but the word of God teaches. Oh, no, that's hard. Yeah, but uh, that's what Jesus is. So I would say, if you think that way, please don't choose Jesus. <laughs> Maybe you should take something easy. Don't don't take this because Jesus is all about kingdom principles. And that's when you he's talking about a very higher level of love. And what is that he's going to teach us through this? I just want to give you a, a clarity. Okay, there are different kind of uh, forms of love, you know, right? For example, you love your brother or sister. That's like a very uh, different kind of love, right? A love where you say uh, more like a, we call it the philia or the brother, brotherly love you have for someone. Everybody can show brotherly love. And there's a, your movies will teach you this kind of love, right? The eros love, the, the sexual love. How do I seduce someone? That kind of love they teaches. But Jesus is not talking about a love that, on that texture, he's talking about a love called agape because the very Hebrew, I mean, the word love, he's talking about the very word love. If you take verse 43, he's talking about a love, love your enemies. And I say that, but I tell you, love your enemies. The word love in Greek there means agape love. Okay, what does it mean? It is all about being unselfish. It's talking about uh, uh not having 
even if it hurts you still love <laughs> that's the kind of love he is talking about it is unselfish and it is all about having the best for someone else let me give a small quote to demo uh, to kind of explain this further okay La to make it very easy for you i know sometimes it's easy for you uh, one is if someone does bad to you okay someone does bad to you and you do that same thing which we call the tit for tat right someone roast and you roast back because that's a, that's a canadian slang <laughs> you ro someone roast you roast back that is like what to say tit for tat or uh, evil for evil you know what the uh, what you become if someone does evil for evil on a course of time they become an animal try doing that to a dog try doing that to your cat evil for evil you become an animal okay the second thing it says you do good now you'll remember those things right you do good but someone does evil to you remember that person who did evil to you oh my god i did good but that person did bad to me and that if you do it continuously like that when you do you know then then you do good but then so you get back as evil that is evil for good the it is satanic or it is devilish only evil people can do that you need to be really a child of devil to do that because you uh you for good you do evil for good you do evil there is a third kind of group which is you do good i'll do good this is more like the buddha style you know what's the buddha style you do good i'll do good seriously that is human if you are human you know you the, the world talks about that right at least you should be human what is being human i do good you do good that's what you expect from people that's being human there is a fourth category which jesus is talking about what you get is evil but you're doing good that is good for evil oh no that is what jesus is talking about being good for evil which is divine which is divine and that is agape love which jesus is talking about now we understand what is love here he is not talking about evil for evil not evil for good not talking about good for good all other faith and all other religion can talk about it do good you get good no my jesus is not talking about that we are getting a little more higher my friend he is talking about how do we become how do we do good we definitely know it is evil okay now let me jump in to explain what it is so that's easy for you to understand the expectation here okay so this is completely different kind of love and it's not the world teaches so you will not find in anywhere else and only can jesus teach it uh, i mean jesus brought forth that and he showed it he showed it the romans the roman soldier was or the, the the scribes or the pharisees was spitting on his face right now what he did he didn't do evil for them he said father forgive them for what they they do not know what they doing no they knew exactly what they were doing that guy knew he is spitting on his jesus face but jesus said lord do not take it on him do not you know he do not know what he is doing so keep in mind now this is a mandate let me tell you this is like an expectation or a demand god keeps for every person who says i want to follow jesus now it's not following jesus is not just wearing a cross around your neck please keep that in mind it's not wearing a cross around your neck but jesus is saying how do i show how do i show good for evil okay i'm going to tell you three three uh Uh, i would say three expectation which jesus says or you will receive when we keep that in fact the title there in that matthew it says love for enemies now i'm going to help you how are the three ways we can get it done okay the uh, first one is new life second one is new love and the third one is new maturity new life new love new maturity i'm going to go faster into that so that you'll understand okay the first thing is new life sometimes people i ask the a uh, lot of people asking them you know do you read the bible yes i read the bible okay you read the bible then i ask them 
you read the whole bible no i don't read the whole bible because you see jesus came in new testament so i'm not reading the old testament <laughs> seriously now i would tell them okay let me show you jesus also used the old testament okay let me go there verse 43 you have heard that it was said love your neighbor where is that come from you will if you are doing a, i mean referring to a ESV or an IV or you'll find a subscript below it says it is from love your neighbor he's quoting from um, exactly he's quoting from Leviticus chapter 19 and 18 Sivani you're there please read it I know I'm gonna if someone else there also you can read it Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 it says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. You want to read one more verse, which would give you more pointers. Uh, Exodus chapter 23, verse 4 and 5. If you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to return it. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure you help them with it. So Jesus is saying, hey, my friend, he's quoting two texts over there. In fact, referring to Old Testament. So please don't skip your Old Testament, my friend. <laughs> Even Jesus wants us to, you know, recommends Old Testament. So he's saying, you know, you have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He's quoting an Old Testament. But then he's saying, but I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Now, what is he trying to say? Uh, Simini, you read those two texts, right? It is very clear. God is saying, you know, love, you love your neighbor. According to a Jew, who is a neighbor? Who is a neighbor? If the Jews don't live with someone Gentiles, they live with another Jew. So he's saying, for example, your next door, uh, who is your neighbor? Today, you don't live with a neighbor of your own race and color and uh, nation nationality, but you have someone. I have another uh, Italian on my right or, uh, you know, uh, a Jamaican on the other side. I don't know, but uh, they had a neighbor who is exactly from their fold, right? So it is uh, So it is easy for them to say, I have to love my neighbor. But Jesus is saying, my friend, I'm not talking about your own on on your own identity of people but to someone else who's outside who's beyond who does hate who does uh you know hostile things to you who you don't like now let me keep it it's not they don't like you but you don't like them let me put it it's very easy for christians today you know ask them do you have enemies no no i don't have any enemies yeah, because I don't have anything, you know, people don't have anything against me. So it's easy for me to forgive them. It's not about they don't like you, but it's about you don't love them or you don't like them. That's what he's saying. So the definition here is he's saying it's not about the neighbor here, what you say of your own fellow Jew. He's talking about when he says an unbeliever, perhaps a girl in the school, the girl in the school who is really bugging you, who is bullying you, who is calling out a lot of names on you, who is irritating you, or the other one or the family relative who is not your cousin whom you don't like. Think about it. He's talking about someone who is right now not in good terms with you, unbeliever, pagan, and in fact, he's saying persecute because someone who does, he's not fair and square with you. You did not, you did good, but you, what you got is evil. You did good, but you got is evil. I'm telling you, but that person is being doing evil after evil. But, and that makes you say, today the uh, world teaches you is this. Yeah, I'm sorry to see even in church people do that, right? If they don't like someone, what they do? They turn and go and sit in some other place. Seriously? <laughs> That's not from the Bible. That's not from the Bible. Have you seen that? There are Christian families, Christian marriages breaking because, because they don't talk to anyone. How many years you don't speak to someone? You cut off a relationship because you don't want to talk to them. Because 
because what you got is evil. You planted good after good and what you got is evil. And then Jesus is talking about those people and he's saying the Old Testament was talking about this, but I'm telling you, your neighbor is not someone who your fellow Jew, but I'm talking about beyond unbeliever or person who could hate you. Okay, that's what he's talking about. Now, I like that word. If you, if you want to see this word, doing more, verse 47. Sometimes people are come and ask you, right? Uh, you know, what should I do? Because they are doing evil after evil. I did good after good, but Jesus is saying, how much? And if you greet only your own people, verse 47, if you greet your own people, what are you doing more than others? Uh, circle the word more. <laughs> more. Sometimes we think, okay, my God, I've done enough. Have you ever felt enough? This is enough. I've tried it. This is enough. But Jesus is saying, no, no, no. Don't stop. Don't stop. Do more. Do more. Keep doing more. Do best. And that's what he's talking about. In fact, I picked up the amplified version to see the word do more, you will find the word B-E-S-T. So give your best, the best of your good, the best of your good, nothing short of it. He continues to do more. But I want to explain to you, okay? When you say this is a life or a new life, when you come, when you believe in Jesus, when you claim to say, I am a follower of Jesus, I'm a disciple of Jesus, it is not about evil for evil or good for evil or good for good but it is like you say i'm going to do good even though it happens even though the target you receive or the output you receive is evil that's what you get to see that okay now now it's easy to be said but jesus wants to give you a demo right jesus wants to give you a demo some you know i talk pretty practical i don't talk theories to you right so like that let me show you what is practical now, first is new life. The second is new love. Okay, new love. Now, what is new love? If I ask this word love to anyone, you know what they say? Perhaps you put it online and do a search. Do a Google search. What do you get? How to fall in love. How to show romance. It's They would talk a lot about romantic love. Tell me someone here who hasn't, haven't fallen in love. Nobody here can say that, right? You liked someone. You love someone. So it's all about a feeling. But Jesus is talking about not a feeling. Let me be very clear. Jesus is not talking about a feeling. Jesus is ta not talking about a theory. If you take the real word of the word uh, love, he's talking about, he's talking about something, an action. He's talking about a word action. How many times you find the word do coming in this five verses? Someone you count and tell me how many times the word do comes here in the same text which we read. How many times? Pick it up faster. You can find it in verse 46. Doing, huh? then doing more, verse 47. Then another do in verse 47. Three times you'll find Jesus is talking. Love is an action, my friend, and not a feeling. Sometimes we Christians make it so easy by saying, oh, I feel like that. Sister, what would you do for me? I'm in a crisis. I'll pray for you. That's not enough. That's not enough. Because he's saying you need to do something about it. And especially for someone who's whom you hate, whom you, I don't use the word hate. Maybe I would use the word whom you don't like because that's the way Christians talk, right? I don't like that person much, but that's hatred. If you take a dictionary meaning of what is hatred, it's, you'll find that dislike. Synonym of hatred is dislike. Uh, by the way, I want to clarify that. We say we use a euphemism called dislike, but actually it means hate. So Jesus uses the word do, uh, and I want to take the same text which Jesus quoted Leviticus chapter 19 and 18, you can learn this better from none other than Dr. Luke. Now, Dr. Luke writes a gospel in chapter 10. You want to turn with me to chapter 10. Quickly, we're going to read that and, uh, uh, and we're going to jump into an explanation. 
Okay, just uh, turn with me to chapter 10. You want to read from uh, verse 30 and uh, quickly we can uh, read till 36. Go on. Luke chapter 10, verse 30 to 36. Someone wants to read? Okay. Simone, are you reading? Oh, you're reading? Good. Femina, lovely. Go on. Um. So from verse 30 to what verse? 36. Okay. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Yay, thank you for reading that, Femina. Appreciate that. So I want to tell you, I don't have time, but I want to jump in quickly and say these two groups of people, the Jews and Samaritans, let me set to the context. They don't like each other, or perhaps we can say they hate each other. There's high hostility there. In fact, you want to understand when Jesus was talking to a Samaritan woman in Matthew and John, John chapter 4, you find that you're given a time you can read as a homework to see how she says, like, you know, I can't even use Jews don't even use the use those things, the dishes or anything that belongs. Like, how do I draw water from the well? No, that's the kind of animosity they don't like use or they don't talk or they do not connect. According to a Jew, the, the Samaritan is very lowly, despicable and someone whom you um they are not original. They are not like, you know, they are, they are not the people. In fact, they are compared to very, very cheap, very, very cheap and least. Now, in another context, I want to tell you, uh, they call out Jesus, John chapter 8. In fact, you don't have to, uh, you can get a time. Uh, you can read John. I think it comes in John 8, uh, 48. Um, they even, one man, uh, once I think Jesus was called as a Samaritan and a demon possessed because they get, they get angry. And the, the cheapest way to shout, I don't know if your mom and dad gets angry or your family, somebody gets angry. They use certain words, right? They compare you to something else. And now this person compared Jesus to a Samaritan, to that level of hostility. Now, the, why am I saying this? You need to keep the back, backdrop of this parable, which Jesus used to a lawyer. The lawyer came and asked him, what should I do? What should I do? What was 25 of Luke 10? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that's when Jesus says, like, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart. I mean, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Look at that. And love your neighbor. He's quoting the same text. Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. So I'm just picking on, we are in how to show that new love, the love which is an action. Now he's talking about, you know, how Jesus answers. You know, you want to know who's your neighbor? You need to understand he quotes this parable. And Dr. Luke is the only one who records this. And you find him, he's talking about three characters there. Probably the person who got injured on the road is must be a Jew. Okay, who is the person who helped him? Who is the person who helped him? I'm asking a quiz to you. Who is the person who helped? Come on. You're muted. A Samaritan helped him. Okay, who are the who are the other two people who passed by? Come on, friends. Open your mouth, please. Who are the other two people who passed by? A you priest can't... and a Levite. Yeah, a priest and a Levite. Now, are they unbelievers? Keep in mind, a priest is someone who is a head of the church. 
he's maybe is going to deliver the sermon shortly i don't know whether this guy got injured on a got uh, beaten up on a uh, on a sabbath or, or was it on a sunday morning i don't know what it, what was the time or which day of the week but of course the priest is very busy he's going to deliver a sunday service or a, a you know a cottage prayer meeting i don't know and what about a levite he is a levite is supposed to your know, occupation is to serve at the tabernacle or the temple right now now you keep in mind these are the background of the people you're talking about jesus is not quoting about someone someone who is not uh, below in caliber he is talking about someone highest of caliber now he brings three people out there i want to keep you in mind he is talking about uh, one emphasis there the uh, concept of doing right the concept of doing keep that in mind love is not a feeling but love is a doing that's what he's trying to talk i i just reminded by this verse in 1 john 3:18 which apostle john writes it you want to read that 1 john 3:18 perhaps you should say this in memory memorize and write this text i put it as a plaque on my wall uh, 1 john 3:18 someone there Pastor, one John three eighteen, verse eighteen. Mm -hmm. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. I want you to memorize this. This is one of my texts. My mom made me to memorize very early in life. Let us not love with words, or you know, words in amplified will say in theory. <laughs> Let you know somebody write love letters. stop love letters do get into action <laughs> you get know what i'm saying people write lot of love letters right love romance and all that let us not love with words or in speech speech is like tongue they can talk hours to you over phone what i love you so much i love you so much in fact people say it to you the 300 times in 300 in a year 300 times because people say like in relationship they need to say that again and again but john says it's not about using your tongue or with words but with action and in truth in fact he's saying it is in sincerity in practical you know showing it in action the same text luke 10 talks about two times the very word do the very word do do look at that verse 26 you have answered correctly he said to the lawyer do this and you will live look at that another time he says verse 37 of luke chapter 10 go and do likewise i can't emphasize more my friend love is not just a feeling it is not just a feeling it is an action unless you do an action you are not loving someone now for example especially someone who hate you hate not someone who hates you but you hate someone but you can say like comfortably you can say oh i can pray for you sister i can pray for that brother but john is talking jesus is talking and saying we need to show it in action how do i show it in action let's take the example of what good samaritan was trying to do i mean the samaritan man in fact he was called good samaritan later but he's still a samaritan you know what he did i want to pick up you know did they teach you grammar in your school okay i love grammar and in that you i want you to focus on the word verbs you know what is a verb a verb is called a doing word i'm not teaching a grammar class but i want to tell you a verb is a doing word now love is a doing word which is a verb okay it is not just anything else it's a doing word i'm going to show you 10 verbs mind you 10 verbs you will be surprised what jesus is trying to emphasize here catch run with me otherwise you'll miss that okay turn with me to luke chapter 10 luke chapter 10 and i'm going to say to you verse 33 but a samaritan as he traveled verb 1 he came where the man was he is not driving tesla he was he is having a donkey i don't know how healthy the donkey is not a tesla a donkey he had so he needs to pull the donkey and say hey hey go near that side the man is lying that that side of the end of the road he is half dead he's beaten by the way stripped he has no clothes on keep that in mind i'm giving a visual of that person now he first one he came near 
where the person was that means he has to pull the donkey and really say okay shushu go near the place where this man is and secondly he saw that person right you got to check is he really alive T toss it and turn it this is a doing word it's not just seeing but tossing and turning and seeing is he alive is he still breathing and then he took pity on him and he, you know what he did he went to him and bandaged now is it bandage is just a inactive word it's a doing word he puts a bandage on him bandage on his wounds pouring what is pouring it's another another doing this is for an enemy this is for an enemy keep in mind it's not the samaritan doesn't like a jew but the jew doesn't like a samaritan keep in mind that now he's pouring oil maybe there is some infection on his wound he's pouring oil and wine then he okay, look at verse 35 i mean verse 34 brought him to an inn i don't know what the distance the travel distance between uh, the location where he died or the half dead he is and then to the inn i want to tell you that road it is 17 miles long road because the journey for someone between Jerusalem to Jericho, there is a road which goes, which is above sea level because some of you have been to Israel and you you will know for sure there is, because these Samaritans are like kind of hostile people, they don't take the roads which Jews would take it and usually they, they take in a separate route and then it is the route which he's talking about is pretty barren, rugged and it's above sea level and it's a little bit steep and it's 2,500 above sea level, that kind of uh, height. It's a descent road. Like you're falling, let's say like you're coming down from Rockies. How many of you have been to Rockies? I don't know. Maybe you've been to some uh, Himalayas or somewhere. But coming down, it's a descent road. That is the narrow strip he's coming down. And usually that kind of road, there's a den of robbers are there. So people can hurt the travelers and then they can take the money and run away. That's the context which Jesus is trying to say. And now this man, uh, probably a Jew, he traveled and he's beaten, half beaten there. And now what this man does, a Samaritan takes him to the inn. And that is another doing word, took care of him so that he stays overnight. He stays probably on overnight. My Bible says the next day. So that means overnight he stayed with him, right? The next day probably he's been awake all the night. Hey, are you breathing, man? Are you alive? Do you need something more? Are you okay? It's not that Samaritan didn't have a schedule. I don't know whether somebody can come into you like that with your plans being for the week. Today, people ask you so many things. Can we speak to you? Can we do this? Now, what about Samaritan? You think he's jobless? No. He spends all of the time he finds this man midway and tries to help him be going beyond his calendar, took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, that is two silver coins, which is equal to two days wages. They say, I mean, the scholars say the two days silver coin wages can keep someone in an inn for two months. That's the value of the money those days. So he pulls out his money. He doesn't think not only that, I want to tell you, it's not people think like, okay, I'm praying for you. No, I'm not just praying for you. I'm getting into and doing it, loving with action and in truth, not just by not just by doing some service, but also by giving out money he's doing to Dinarai and gave them to the innkeeper. Now look at that. Look after him when I return. So there is a return. He has to come back again. It's another doing word. I will return. And look after him. I will reimburse. I will pay you back. Whatever you spend, I will pay you back. For the any extra expense you may have. Now, if you count, totally 10 verbs you'll find. So love is an action, my friend. Don't get misled, kind of misled by some romantic letters alone or by some, some words and feelings. Don't get misled, kind of misled by it you know those kind of stuff love is not just a feeling it is just an action and especially to someone who don't who is doing something something very hard to you hurting you how do you still show it and that's what the samaritan man showed which is jesus is talking about where he showed by all these 10 words let's not miss it 
By the way, I was curious on those two characters, which is the priest and the Le Levite, right? Now, they are very pious people. I really think they're very pious people. They have a busy agenda every week. And a lot of us in this room are very busy, very pious. We do a lot of right things. But God is saying, you may be doing the right things. You know, what's one of the common excuse you can find? What the, What is the common excuse both both these people gave? Do you get it? What is the two common excuse? Let me pull that for you so it's easy. Number one, when they passed on the other side, I don't have time. When they passed on the other side, you know what they said? Not me. Maybe someone else will. Not me. Someone else will. Maybe I'm going. Someone, if I can, I can't do it now. Not me. Someone else will do it. Whenever you skip something, we'll do that, right? Probably the priest thought the Levi would do, do it. And the Levi thought somebody will come and Someone else will come behind him and probably do it. But then it leaves with nobody coming in. Now think about it. The second excuse we give is, first is not me. Second is not now. Not now. Maybe later. Maybe later. Why are you not doing now? No, not now. Maybe later. See, I'm going on a very busy, I have to go preach now. I have to go lead a choir now. I have to go play music now. I have to, all in the church, all in the church. I have to do it for my family. I have to do this. I have to do that. All the good things. See, the devil does it very politely, very modestly. Sometimes you may think, oh my God, is, the is it from the devil or is it like from you or what exactly? Because you think you did not say anything wrong. Probably if you do an interview with the Levite and the priest, he will say, no, I didn't do anything wrong. I went... I had a agenda to lead worship and do a sermon and all that. So that's why I have to run in. Sir, on the way, you saw this person. So it's all about two excuses, which is not me and not now. Okay, my friend, keep that in mind. I just want to tell you it's not, it's not, about, it's not about a feeling. It's about an action. Quickly, we said about new life, the new life, new love. And I'm going to talk to you about the third thing, which is new maturity. What is the new maturity? I really found it very uncomfortable when Jesus read this. You want to read that verse 48? Someone there, verse 48. John chapter, I mean, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. 47, maybe. And if you 40, could open your Yeah, 48 own. would be fine. 48. 48? Yeah. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Be for perfect. And today we just say it's impossible to. Why did Jesus use the word perfect? Why did Jesus use the word perfect? Sometimes we think like it's impossible to be perfect. What is Jesus trying to tell you? The very word perfect, we may not think like, okay, I got to be perfect. Nobody can be perfect, right? Nobody can be perfect. But Jesus is teaching us how you can grow up in that. I want to tell you four things that what is Jesus is explaining there. Number one, he's talking about a mark of maturity. There is, when someone behaves evil for evil, or they do evil for good, it, I would just take it as immature. It's a mark of Im immaturity. The mark of maturity is like, how do I do good for evil, right? So he's talking about the level of maturity. Remember year one of your Christian walk, year one, the first time you heard about Jesus, year two, year three, year four, I think the more you walk with Jesus day after day, year after year, it's about the mark of maturity. You become strength to strength where you move on from, okay, you do bad, but I can't become bad like you. I'm not going to overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. That's, that's the level of maturity he's talking about. Second, he's talking about God-like. How do you become, become like Jesus? For some people, they may not even read a Bible. For some people, they may not even read, read a Bible. You will be the only Bible they read. Can you agree or not? Say, for example, some people, I've just seen that. Uh, sometimes people come and ask you, uh, why you do it? Are you Christian? They ask you the question. And that's a sense of, um, I, I tell you, that really compels you, right? Um, because somebody saw Jesus in you. 
are you a Christian? Because only Christians will do that. They get beaten up for no reason. So that's a way where he's seeing, you may be the only Bible people can see, becoming God-like. And thirdly, I like the way what he's trying to say, which is perfect, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. He is saying, uh, look at the thing. He gives an analogy. I want you to read this, which he says, um, do you want to read that verse in, uh, maybe you can read this verse uh, 45, someone there, you can read it. 45, chapter 5, 45. That you may be sons of your father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Just because someone is bad, do they not get a shower of rain? Now think about it. Sometimes you may think like, oh God, you are, you know, I do good, therefore only the rain and the shower and the sun and the wealth of this planet should be for me and those evil people should be dealt with they should be judged <laughs> they should be condemned they should be cursed for all the evil people uh, have you ever felt that now they also get a fair exchange right sometimes you may think like oh my god they deserve that these people they deserve something bad because of all the evil they do but jesus is saying look at that he's saying he compares he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you think deeper about the meaning, Jesus uses a unique formula which is called mercy formula. You know what is mercy formula? Grace is God's unmerited favor, but mercy is when you dis when you you and me deserve punishment, he shows mercy, he shows compassion. Actually, I deserve death, hell, and grave. But what God gives us is heaven, righteousness, and gift of salvation. So, actually, these people may deserve the good or the bad people, which you think like the evil, may not. You may think, oh, man, they don't need the sun. <laughs> they don't need the rain. They don't need the wealth of the land or all this. But God is saying it is all about mercy. You know why? Sometimes you may ask the question, Jesus, why do you want to show mercy to all these people? I've seen a lot of people are coming and asking that. You know, why Jesus have to show mercy? I want to tell you, Jesus, God doesn't want only one son because he gave us one and only son that you and me can be saved. But he want more children in his family. He want many people in the bus, many people into the ark. As Noah's ark was not just made for eight people. He want 8,000 people to get in. But none of those guys got in. But the question is how we can be and bring those people inside the room, right? Bring them into the bus. Bring them into. That's what God wants more people. That's the mercy formula he uses. Now, when you see that, it is a very high, very, very higher plane. Uh, it may sound very illogical. If you try and go and tell someone, hey, that person is doing bad, you do good. They may think, are you out of your mind, Chris? Out of your, you're out of your mind. Is it no logic? Yeah, no logic. How can you do that? How can you do that? No logic. But if you really think that, it is not the Jesus style. Jesus style is the higher plane. And that's what he's talking about. Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. You would say that, you know, why am I showing good? Because my heavenly father is good. He's a good, good father. He will never go lower his standard. The standards are always high. So don't change for someone else's sake. Let me say that to you, my friend. Just because someone is doing bad, you don't become like them. If you become like them, you become immature. You need to become like your heavenly father because that's what he's saying. So it's about new maturity. New maturity. Now I want to come to a closing on this particular thing. Sometimes we may get very tired, right? I become tired, you become tired. Uh, sometimes because all you do good and you get bad. All you do good when you get bad. But Jesus is saying something here. If you take the word, I want you to look at the word Luke chapter 10. There is a word Luke chapter 10. 
God uses the word two do's over there. I told you, right? Do it likewise. Do it and live. Luke chapter 10 verse 35 onwards, you can find in the parable. Do, go and do likewise. If you look at the root word in the amplified, you will find he's talking about do habitually, habitually, constantly. That's what he's trying to do. When you take the verse 37, go and do likewise. He's talking about constantly. He's talking about a continuous tense. That means not yesterday, what you did today, but do it tomorrow also. Do it continuously. Even if that person is doing bad, even if that person is going to do bad, intentionally they're doing bad, it's okay. But you do it continuously. What makes me say that I want you to read this verse, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Someone there, you want to read that? Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Is Femina or Sivani reading? I don't know. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Even Jerome there. Jerome can read too. Yeah. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Let us not become weary in doing good, but in the proper, you see, in due season, in due season, I, I like the word, in due, at the proper time, in fact, and I will say at the proper time, we will reap a harvest, not a grain, but a harvest of grain, right? Harvest if we do not give up, but don't quit, huh? don't give up, don't become tired, don't become saying, okay, that's enough, that's enough, this is over, sixth time, seventh time. Seven times I can do, 80 times I can do, but not eternally, not continuously, not habitually. But don't become, don't give up. That's what Apostle Paul writing to the Galatian church. So don't miss that, okay? But I also think like if you don't give up, what happens, I'll tell you. If you don't give up, what happens? This is what happens in Proverbs 16, verse 7. I've seen it. I've seen it happening. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7. You want to read that? Or I can do it. When the Lord takes pleasure in anyone's way, he causes their enemies to make peace with them. Okay? Let Another translation says, if a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even, even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's what happened to King David. All the people even around his boundaries, his enemies became guard and short. There's a wall of peace around, right? I tell you, if you do not give up, those enemies can be friends or God turns that. And that's a God we serve. So my friend, don't give up, okay? Even if you, if you don't see it happening, shall we pray? Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for speaking to us, O oh Lord. You told us, O oh God, how to love those who, those I hate or you hate or anybody hates in this room, O oh God. Instead of the word hate, we if we put the word dislike, there are so many times we would have disliked someone, oh God. Forgive us, first of all. We would like to repent and forgive. And that's the daily prayer. That's the that's the prayer you taught us, oh Father. The new standard of loving, oh God. It's about loving that person whom you dislike, oh God. And because it is becoming like the Father, becoming like the Father, oh God. And it's about an action. Sometimes we think it's just a feeling. We're sorry, oh God. Help us to go do more and more. Even if we get tired, how we don't give up on that, oh Lord. Show mercy, oh Father. Help us to show mercy to the rest of us around. It could be that friend. It could be that family member. It could be another sibling. Oh God, help me, help us to show love in the way you have the agape love which you want us to do. And that is being Christ-like, oh God. Thank you, Father, for speaking to us. We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Any questions?